There's good evidence for an ice age, but where does it fit into the Bible? Today on Creation Magazine Live, details about a post-flood ice age. Hi, I'm Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to be talking about evidence for an ice age. And so um, there is actually a great abundance of evidence for the fact that there was an ice age on this planet at one time. Right. Now, now there's controversy as to how many ice ages there were, depending on which, which scientists are, are, are discussing it. Yes, yeah. But um, as far as just evidence that we believe that there was an ice age, well, yeah. Um, you know, glaciers that, that grow, uh, as they're, they're growing, they're going to be picking up, scouring the, the, the ground, picking stuff up. As they retreat, they're going to drop that stuff as the, the stuff melts. So that's why you're driving along sometimes, you see a nice clear, and all of a sudden there's this big boulder there. You say, well, how'd that boulder get there? Right. The things like yep. that, moraines, till deposits, um, you know, U-shaped valleys uh, as, as the glaciers retreat, et cetera. So there's... Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence, evidence for an ice age. So from, from a Christian perspective, to, to argue that there was no ice age and, and things like that. We don't that's think really, that's a... That's not, that's not a, a, a really valid position scientifically. Right. Everybody agrees, every, every, everybody involved in geology and looking at the earth and so on, everyone agrees that there was an ice age. The question is, for us as Christians, right. where does that fit into the Bible? Because the Bible doesn't seem to mention... A big event like that. And that's what we want to work toward on, on this show here. And there's actually a, a few surprises that we have as well as far as, as, far as which uh, system of history an ice age best fits into. Right. The evolutionary timeline or the biblical timeline that's is right. what you're referring to. Much of to. the data interpreted by evolutionists for multiple ice ages is best understood and can easily be interpreted as the advance and retreat of a single ice age. Yeah, so to clarify, an ice age is characterized by kilometers thick glaciers that scour the landscape, they grind up rocks, they scratch rocks, you know, and you'll see evidence of that, you know, where rocks have, have, yeah, yeah. and all these types of things. And, um, and it's not this notion that people say, well, an ice age, that means the entire world was covered with ice. Not at all. That's not what it means. No. It just means that the ice caps at the, pole, the North and South Pole grow and then they shrink back. Uh, toward the end of the Ice Age. Right, and so if you see a map of, of, of what they consider to be the Ice Age, it'll only extend a certain portion, and et cetera. Right. Um, the, the ice never covered more than about a third of the Earth's surface at, its, at, the, at the period of maximum glaciation. Right. It never covered more than a third of the Earth's surface. So the first thing we need to ask is, well, how do you generate an Ice Age anyway? Like, what, what would the conditions have to be like? And so the, you need actually three conditions. You need more evaporation. Because uh, you know okay, you're going to need from the oceans, from the oceans, yeah. because the water for these mile-high glaciers are going to have to come from somewhere. That's a lot of water. Where's it going to come from? Well, from the oceans. So you need more evaporation. You need more snowfall. So that means that evaporation needs to fall in the form of snow in order to pack down. You start creating these these glaciers, uh, ice and stuff like that. So that means you need cooler summers. So th that that snow needs to fall on colder land masses so that it doesn't melt, so that you can get the accumulation. You can build um, it up year after year after year. Exactly. So, so essentially, uh, we, could, we could boil it down to even two right. uh, major components. Warm oceans that produce more evaporation and cool continents. That's right, cold land masses. So That's exactly right. How, how do we get that? The, it, <laughs> what causes that? Well, right. we'll, uh, evolutionists have difficulty modeling an ice age, and today that the way this is done is with, with weather software. Right. You change the, um, uh, for example, the greenhouse gases, the radiation from the sun, and so on. And what evolutionists typically play with is, is scenarios such as uh, the sun's radiation lessening. Right. For tens of thousands of years. And, so and less heat coming from the sun. Less heat, but the, the problem with that is um, if you cool down the oceans, you shut down evaporation. Well, that was one of the three conditions. That was one of the, the major conditions, right? You right. Need, you need warmer oceans so you get more precipitation. But if you've got less heat, you've got cooler oceans, uh, you've just taken away one of your conditions here. Right. So, so you, you, it's, and it's this problem that uh, you know, it, it's a problem for evolutionists to generate this because you need both heat and cool. And so what kind of condition is going to generate those three things naturalistically over millions of years? Right. 
And evolutionists believe that, there, of course, the ice ages have been cyclic. There's been many ice ages. Well, some do. Uh, some are, are going for the one ice age uh, thing now, because I guess it's a problem enough to cause one, let alone multiple it, it ones. But anyway, there's different, one. different yep. theories out there. So what are we going to say as, as, as Christians? We're, we're going to look at what the Bible says about Earth history. We're going to look at, if, is there an event in there that could come up with these two conditions that, we, that are vital to coming up with an ice age? And of course, uh, we, we believe Genesis is plainly written. We're looking at Genesis 6 to 9. There was a global flood. We're going to show that it actually provides the conditions required uh, for an ice age and how that fits into biblical history. If you have ever tried to knuckle walk on all fours like a gorilla, you'd soon realize that it's difficult to do. But some apes do this with ease, partly because they have specialized wrist joints, which we don't have. Australopithecus afarensis, also known as Lucy, is an ape-like creature that some claim is our ancestor. Evolutionary books show pictures of Lucy walking upright, so you wouldn't expect her to have knuckle walking wrist joints. But recently, scientists were shocked to discover this wrist joint structure in Lucy's kind. According to one of the researchers, I walked over to the cabinet, pulled out Lucy and Shazam! She had the morphology that was classic for knuckle walkers. If Lucy really is our ancestor who walked upright, why does her wrist anatomy suggest she walked on all fours? It just does not add up. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, at the end of the last segment, I made the claim that Noah's flood would actually um, produce the conditions required for an ice age. Uh, we said there was three conditions, but really boiled it down to two. We would need warmer oceans, cooler land masses in order to generate the right conditions in order to trigger an ice age. Right. And so many people might have been thinking, well, how would that work? Okay, exactly. well, let's, let's run yep. through that. So we have, uh, the, the Bible talks about the fountains of the great deep opening and the windows of heaven open. So you have kind of these two sources of water, rain right. from above, and, and also something happening in the oceans, uh, the fountains of the great deep, whatever that might be referring to. Right. So creationists believe that there was one continent originally. You may have heard notions of that. That was sort of a creationist idea all along, and the evolutionists have hijacked that of late, and they have you know, Pangaea, which is more of an evolutionary right. concept. But there's ample evidence that the continents have moved apart. The only right. place in biblical history where that could fit is during the flood. Right. That process would mean that hot material comes from the base of the mantle to form new ocean floor. So essentially you've got red hot rock now forming new ocean floor, which is going to vaporize huge amounts of seawater. Which means that uh, the oceans are going to be uh, affected by that heat. And it doesn't mean the oceans are going to be boiling, but they're probably going to be warmer after the, flood. after the flood than before the flood. They'd be a lot warmer. And during the flood, they would have been vaporized perhaps several times over right. and then fall as rain. But, but we're talking about after the flood, the oceans would have been warmer. That's the first condition for an ice age, right. man. More evaporation, heat in the oceans. Yep. Again, because of the flood, you have volcanism. Huge amounts of volcanoes putting dust into the atmosphere, which would have cooled down the continents. It's perfect conditions for an ice age beginning immediately after the flood, lasting for about 700 years until the dust from the atmosphere is filtered out and until the, the heat from the oceans gets down to the ocean. I think the average temperature now is about 4 degrees Celsius. Right. Uh, we, we've seen uh, practical uh, examples of this, right? I, I remember at the end of last year, um, there was a volcano go off in, in, in Iceland, in, in, right? In Iceland. In Iceland yeah. That's right. And it caused a major chaos with air traffic because all the dust in the air was getting into the engines and gumming them up and, you know, the planes could go down. So they, they stopped uh, air traffic yeah. for a and while. And also affected weather. Exactly. Yeah. Affected weather. Um, we were actually getting... Uh, cloud cover in southern Ontario here in Canada when Mount St. Helens blew up 1980. in 1980 yeah, way back. because of all the dust that went up in the air. So it, you know, it's, it's reflecting sunlight. Uh, it's, these are perfect examples that we've seen in, uh, recently that could be applied to this, this model and uh, this makes total sense. Um, so when we look at the book of Job, because that's where we get all our knowledge from, is, is from Scripture ultimately, um, you see this verse, Job 28, uh, 38, 29, and 30, and it says, Out of whose womb came the ice and the frost of the heavens, who fathered it? The waters are hidden like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. This is the first time in the Bible that talks about you know, the, the womb of ice. I mean, this obviously was something that Job was observing that must have been pretty... Uh, 
momentous or stupendous or whatever, yes, right? It yes. was, it's almost like he's looking at this this glacier face, going, "Hmm, where did that come from?" Yeah. <laughs> right? and there's there's other uh, there's other talk of, of of ice and snow and that type of th that type of thing in the Book of Job. Right. The events in the Book of Job probably happened short shortly after the flood. Right. It's, it's a, a very, very old, old book, book yep. in the Bible. Yep. Uh, so was the ice age going on during the time of the Book of Job? That makes a lot of sense. It would fit actually. Yep. Um, yep. The Neanderthals. Neanderthals, even, even um, evolutionary anthropologists now group them in with humans, but right. their bone structure was different. Yes. Why? That we would understand Neanderthals as a people group that moved northward from Babel after the dispersion of the Tower of Babel. Yes. They, they, the first uh, Neanderthal was found in the Neander Valley in Germany, and in, in that area, during the time of the Ice Age, it would have been cold and dark and, and damp. Right. It's, it's, it's well understood nowadays that the Neanderthal people suffered from um, bad diet, which would have led to diseases like rickets and arthritis, and an extreme variety of that, yep. causing their bones not to harden, and they, they exhibit the, this, this brutish appearence that we're familiar with with those right. uh, within Neanderthals. So anthropologists have suggested that these brutish appearances um, are partly due to these diseases. They were obviously a very robust people, but perhaps uh, this exaggeration to this brutish image came from some of the, the, the hardships they would be happening if they're living in that part of the area right. uh, where this uh, you know where they would be suffering yeah. the effects of the Ice Age. So again, now, great support for, for biblical history. And here. elsewhere in the world, in, in Egyptian and Babylonia, where there wasn't an Ice Age, no glaciers, the civilization flourished. Right. Lots of evidence for an Ice Age. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Okay, so if the Ice Age happened fairly recently after the Flood, and the Flood right. was, was what, 23, 2400 BC, somewhere around there, Ice Age lasts for about 700 years, something like peaking at maybe 500 years, and, right. and then, uh, I mean, we still see the glaciers melting back today. But uh, folks may be wondering, what about uh, ice cores, drillings of, uh, of, of samples of ice, for example, in the Greenland ice sheet? Don't they show evidence of multiple ice ages over over eons of time. This is what the evolutionists are trying to use yes. to support their story. So layering is certainly visible in the uppermost section of, of these ice cores anyway, right? Because right. as they get compacted, it kind of gets a little blurred. But in the upper, uppermost section, you can see layering. But it really only correlates with an annual pattern in the past few thousand years. So really, uh, this is, is exactly as it should if it represents annual snow deposits since the Ice Age. Right. Right? Yeah. Rather than this, you know, ancient time period, etc., yeah. that evolutionists are pointing to. And when you get lower down, I mean, the, up, the upper portions of it show that, that layering. It's almost like tree, tree rings. Um, right. And you can, you can sort of count the years there. But as you get lower down, those, those layers become less defined right. and can easily be understood as being, being laid down in a single storm. You have different layering right. as the wind changes and so on. Now, this idea that these, you know, takes a long time for this ice to build up, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We had an article in Creation Magazine uh, called The Lost Squadron. I'm just going to uh, describe this, this yes, story because this was an amazing, fascinating story. story. Um, <laughs> An amazing story that helps us understand the formation of, of these Greenland ice sheets. Um, on July 15, 1942, six P-38 fighter planes and two B-17 bombers on their way from a U.S. airfield to a British airfield to join the war were forced to crash land on the east side of Greenland. The crew were all rescued but had to abandon their airplanes. They, they landed uh, wheels up and slid to a stop on the ice. Um, to do this. So that uh, was in 1942 as the Second World War is going on. Right. And in the 80s and 90s, there were some guys that said, hey, we can, uh, we can salvage these airplanes. They were, they were uh, uh, airplane restoration specialists and so right. on. They were they, very interested in these old planes, which learned no the longer history, exist. And they thought, hey, we'll just go and... Yeah, yeah. And uh, U.S. airplane dealer Patrick Epp, uh, Epps told his friend, architect Richard Taylor, that the planes would be like new. 
Uh, quote, all we'd have to do is shovel the snow off the wings, fill them up with gas, crank them up, and fly off into the sunset. Nothing to it. Right, so they <laughs> obviously didn't expect um, there to be a lot of snow yeah. covering them or, or their, ice. Their perception of, of um, the rate at which these things build up is the common perception that most people have today. Right. That the, the Greenland ice sheet has built up over, over eons of time, hundreds of thousands if not millions right. of years. And so the accumulation every year is, is just not that much. Right. But the, the problem was is that they, they attempted to find these planes, but after a little while they did find them. But they found them buried under 75 meters, 250 feet of ice. <laughs> so they expected to find them sitting on the surface. You brush off the snow. You yeah. can't give any. You get along, and all of a sudden they find them buried at 250 feet down. Um, this is a complete shock to them, right? How would this ice have built up so quickly uh, in this this way of yeah, thinking? Yeah, that's amazing. So, that's that's like one and a half five meters feet a year. a year, about five feet a year of of the snowfall. That, that would have had to accumulate since, these since planes, that on time. average. Yeah, yep. incredible. The B-17s were crushed and uh, and unsalvageable under that that weight of ice, but the P-38s, which which are uh, a more which were built more ruggedly, were in better condition. Restoration went ahead. They mm -hmm. they melted a hole down through the ice with this specially designed uh, uh, melting machine. Yep. And uh, uh, the hot water running through tubes of uh, <laughs> copper and so on, uh, uh, po copper pipes. And they, they dismantled some of the P-38s, they brought them to the surface, shipped them back to the U.S., restored them, and with about 80% of the original parts in 2003, after nearly 60 years, the planes flew again. Right. <laughs> so here's a great example how these rates of accumulation are assumed, um, and here's some evidence that they've actually ac accumulated much quicker than, yes, than predicted. Yes, yes, an amazing story. Now, evolutionists and other long ages say that the present is the key to the past, right? Uniformitarianism. Right. So in that case, this 3,000 meter long uh, ice core uh, brought up by the Joint European Greenland Ice Core Project, GRIP, in Greenland in 1990 to 1992, um, would only represent some 2,000 years of accumulation. Yeah, well, we're good with that. We're, we're really good with that. <laughs> it actually, real, so again, real science uh, actually fits in and supports what the scripture says. Uh, so good evidence of the biblical timeline for the Ice Age. In 1978, a team led by Mary Leakey discovered a series of footprints in Tanzania. These are known as the Laetoli footprints. According to many researchers, these footprints are identical to those made by humans. Paleoanthropologist Donald Johansson stated, Make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. Why is it then that most scientists reject the idea that humans made these footprints? To understand this odd situation, it's important to realize that evolutionists think that the footprints were made in ash 3.6 million years ago. Therefore, according to such evolutionary ideas, humans weren't around then, so the footprints can't be human. But if a human didn't make the footprints, who or what did? A Scientific American article acknowledges that this is still an unsolved mystery, but I can't help feel it's just a mystery of their own making, caused by their evolution thinking instead of taking the Bible's history seriously. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, people often talk about mammoths associated with the Ice Age, right? Sure, yeah. Um, they often associate the two, and uh, the remains of hundreds of thousands of, of woolly mammoths are found across northern Europe, uh, Siberia, and Alaska. There was actually a, a lucrative trade in, in mammoth ivory for many, many years. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there are remains out there of, of thousands of these creatures. Yes, estimates suggest that at least a million mammoths must have at one point been living in, in those northerly areas, right. along with uh, large populations of woolly rhinoceros, uh, rhinoceros, of bison, horses, antelopes. So, so the question is, if, if these ice ages, um, plural, uh, according to the evolutionists, come slowly and disappear slowly, right. How could these huge populations of, of, of sizable animals survive? What would they, what would they drink? What would they right. eat in an icy wasteland? What would a million cows eat in an area? <laughs> Let, yeah. Yes. Um, yep. So a lot of the carcasses of these creatures still exist, and they show signs of considerable uh, decomposition. Uh, about half a dozen intact uh, frozen carcasses have been found. Um, and, and a lot of these carcasses have been found with, with their stomach contents largely unde undigested. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and some people, have, of course, claim that, well, this is evidence of a snap freeze, yeah. right? That these, that's the these, only explanation. That's that the works. only explanation. If, if there's stomach contents in there, um, that's, that's what must have happened, right? Yeah. 
Uh, now, we, we, we don't need to, undigested stomach con contents don't necessarily require this explanation right. because uh, there's been frozen uh, a mastodon found in Ohio in the U.S. Uh, sorry, unfrozen. Unfrozen, unfrozen <laughs> obviously, in Ohio yep. in the U.S. And it had undigested plant material in its stomach. An elephant's right. stomach, which is similar to a mastodon or mammoth, an elephant's stomach is, uh, it, it acts more like a storage container, like a storage vat that stores the food, and then the food is fermented and digested in the hindgut, right. uh, sort of like horses. Um, so you wouldn't expect uh, the, the food to be digested there, and it's not really surprising that the food wasn't digested. We don't need to invoke this uh, you know, massively catastrophic Right. Uh, uh, idea to explain the mammoths now remember, up north. Now remember too that the, a lot of these uh, carcasses of mammoths that have been found were, um, they, they've, they look like they've been rotting for a little, a little while. There's you know, serious decomposition in some of these. Right. Also they found a flar, uh, sorry, fly larvae inside some of these decomposed carcasses. So that shows that the creature died, uh, flies landed on them, Deposited larvae it's in been the rotting and it's yeah. been rotting. So obviously yeah. this flash snap freeze doesn't make sense because of it. How would the flies have got to the creek, etc. Right. So there there are some problems. Of course we got some cave paintings of mammoths, obviously done by people living after the flood. So um, they, right. they, they've yep. seen these creatures. And, and there's um, evidence that mammoths lived as far south as Mexico. So they were adapted to a, a wide range of climates. Right. Um, the burial and freezing of these mammoths cannot be accounted for with the uniformitarian, evolutionary, the slow and gradual notion of the present is the key to the past right. uh, over many thousands of years. Right. However, while the mammoths are a big mystery to evolutionists, um, they fit in quite well. We can come up with reasonable scenarios to explain the mammoths that are right. found in the biblical flood with a post-flood ice age. Right. So when did they live? I mean, the, the mammoth remains are, are frozen in silt uh, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, a lot of people think they're frozen in ice. Right. That they're, that they're, that they're frozen in these blocks of ice, but right. they're frozen in, in silt right. on now the, top of flood sediments. That's right. The, the silt's laying on top of what we would consider flood sediments. So obviously it happened after uh, sometime after the flood, um, and, and of course we would think during the Ice Age at, at, at some time right, that it right. took place so after the flood. So here's a scenario that's been proposed. Late in the Ice Age, uh, because the, cli the, the climate changes around the Arctic Ocean, there would have been climate changes there, uh, a drought is likely. And then as the, late in the Ice Age, as the glaciers are retreating and exposes the land, there's drought, and then you have dust storms. Right. Because you, you need a source of dust, of wind-blown silt, to bury these mammoths. That's right. what they're buried in. It's windblown silt. And so there, there is a very reasonable biblical scenario based on biblical history to explain the frozen mammoths. They were buried in silt right. and frozen after that. Right. Now if you want details uh, on the Ice Age, you can go to creation.com slash Ice Age and there's a whole Q&A page there that d discusses these things. So here's another example where mammoths uh, are kind of a mystery sometimes uh, for evolutionists to explain. Uh, easily explained by what the what the Bible says and what what biblical history talks about. So again, just uh, giving evidence that uh, really the the Bible should remain our source of, uh, of, right. of information. Creation Magazine is a 56-page full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. Welcome to the feedback section and uh, we get a lot of feedback on creation.com yep. from some of our articles in Creation Magazine. We're just going to go through one here. Um, this lady Maria from the Netherlands and she wrote in and said, Hi there, let me tell you that I'm an agnostic person. There's a question in my head that I wish you can answer. If there's only one true God, how come the world today has diverse religions? A common question, actually. Right. Yeah, a common question. And there's other questions as well yep. in, uh, in her feedback here. Um, this is from February 2012. You can look it up there, the fall and the existence of other religions. You can go to creation.com and see that. But um, uh, the, uh, the response here, this was done by uh, Lita Costner, one of our information officers. And uh, I'll just read the response. It's a, it's a good response. <laughs> doesn't yeah. need any uh, modification. Uh, because the world has fallen 
and some people groups forgot who the true God is, others consciously rejected him, some people still reject him today, we're told that even though people should be able to see God from creation, uh, we're told that even though people should be able to see God from creation, God exists, they reject him and worship other things instead. So the revelation in nature is sufficient only to condemn, not to save. Right. Uh, and, and then another question comes, um, why did he only choose Israel as his chosen people? I mean, why, if you want to recognize, if you want to save everyone, why only Israel? Right. Which, which is a good question as well. Yeah. And the response is, uh, his people were never going to be just Israel. Even in earliest times, we can see God working through Israel to save all nations. Indeed, that was part of the original promise to Abraham. Right. And didn't God promise to Abraham that through him all nations right. would be saved, that, that, yeah. that would, would benefit? Well, these are good questions, and, and I've got this question before. You know, uh, if, if, if Christianity is true, this is the one true God that's been revealed to us, you got all these religions, you know, really what they're saying was, how would you know? It's almost like, well, this is an excuse for why I don't have to believe in God sometimes, right? Because right. I'm not so saying this person, but yeah, yeah, there's so many different religions. How could we know? When I die, I'll just say to God, you know what? I couldn't really know. But you know, when you really think about it, I mean, I'm a fairly linear thinking person. <laughs> if, if, if I'm, you know, looking at all these different uh, religions, I mean, very quickly, I mean, if, if you want to see, you see, see these different myths, okay, we believe that the earth is sitting on the back of a turtle, right? Right. Some, some some people groups have have said that, yes. yeah that's our, our yep. that's our belief you know well get on the space shuttle you go out you turn around you say no you can cross that one off your list pretty quick um, if somebody says something to you like well I believe we got re we get reincarnated you know I've been reincarnated seventy two times what empirical test could you do what what scientific experiment what kind of archaeological uh, findings could I do what kind of history can I can I investigate I mean right. really yep. you're telling me well you got to trust my belief. To prove my belief, yeah, yeah. there's it, it, no way for me to, you know, qualify that. Or, well, I, these religions, you, you need an experience to really know that it's true. Well, have you ever cried when you went to see a movie? Was it real? <laughs> so, if it's based yeah. on experience, you know, it. it, it anyway, right? Uh, How do we choose which religion is uh, is the truth? Right. And a good test of that is uh, your whatever you believe has to explain reality. Right. Whether you're. Uh, <laughs> Hindu or, 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 or Jewish or, or, or a Muslim or, or an atheist, whatever you believe has to explain the world around us. Right. There are uh, tests, so to uh, speak, that you can sure. apply to yeah. all worldviews and, yeah. uh, and we can try to come to a conclusion. And, for example, how do you explain uh, that the very high mutation rates that we see in, in living things, in, in humans, for example, just take humans, uh, how do we explain? Your worldview has to explain that you start with a whole bunch of information that's mutating over time. The fall. It fits with the Bible, you've got the fall in there, and, and many other things that Christianity can explain that other religions can't.